Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give this seminar. I will be talking about engineering long spin currents times uh, for spin orbit qubits in silicon. Uh, but before I dive into that a brief outline of my talk, I've structured the talk in three parts. So we'll first talk about a brief history of quantum information, so the early days in the 80s with Feynman basically kicking this off. Uh, fast forward to the late 90s with the first naive building blocks or visionary building blocks for actual hardware uh, for quantum computing. And then finally, where we are right now uh, with quantum advantage. The second part uh, focuses then on uh, spin-based qubits, uh, look at the DiVincenzen criteria, uh, the environment and the challenges of scaling such a system up. And then finally, a focus on our work uh, where we discuss uh, spin orbit systems in silicon and see how they can be explored in the context of scaling up. But first, let's go back in time to 1981. Uh, this is a group photo from a conference that was held at MIT uh, in May 81. And if you look through the faces, you actually see there was a quite eminent list. If I just call out a few that, that caught my eye, Boudinger, uh, Fred Kintofelli, Landauer, uh, Zuse, uh, Feynman, and many more sort of pioneers of this field. And at uh, that conference, uh, there was in principle a strong focus on the physical limitations of computing, like how much uh, entropy is in a single computing step, ultimate speeds, um, but also on alternative approaches. And that for that part, uh, that uh, similar work from Feynman approach, where Feynman reflected on uh, like what classical physics can be simulated by a classic computer quantum physics can, can be simulated by a classic computer. Can physics be simulated by a quantum computer? And also already asked the question, can a quantum simulation be universal? And so that <clears throat> sort of kicked off the field and then uh, started basically the, the search for the ability to build a quantum computer. Um, so currently, sort of fast forwarding, um, building blocks that have been considered uh, for artificial quantum matter or uh, quantum computing are, are atoms, our macroscopic quantum states, and then spins and semiconductors. And I have here a slide that I like to show just to illustrate how diverse the different choice of qubits are and also just very briefly their strengths and challenges. So I have trapped ions, so the actual atoms in vacuum uh, trapped by an RF field. They're very coherent. They're like basically sort of the sum of the longest standing field. Um, typically, they are arranged in linear arrays up to sort of up to 50. We have cold atoms. These are neutral atoms in optical lattices. Uh, they have pushed a lot the boundary of quantum simulations. They can create quite large systems, hundreds of, uh, of uh, atoms in also 2D arrays. Uh, we have superconducting qubits. A um, bit more in detail about that later. That's, I would say, the leading technology right now with the most complex quantum circuits that is doing the first sort of quantum chemistry calculations and pushing the, uh, like the boundary in terms of what, what can be done in a quantum advantage over classic computing. And then looking at the time scales, to some degree, I have the new kids on the block, which are uh, spins in the solid state. Uh, so we'll show you later, or a lot of us know, they are highly coherent and there is a lot of analogy actually to the the actual, like the real atoms in vacuum that can be realized with the uh, spins in semiconductors. Um, okay, so like some advantages of using the spins, uh, you have like cold atom like uh, Mach into spin one half, like one big deal is like when a fish fermionic systems, like you work with electrons, you get fermionic systems for free. I'm trap uh, like spatial control, you can actually uh, position uh, your, your qubit where you want it and it stays there long uh, spin lifetimes. Uh, you can, if you work with spin orbit systems, you can also like work with holes, get spin orbit coupling. And the good part is in some of you share platform with microelectronics. Um, I, I pulled out these two um, illustrations from two papers that are now more than 20 years old. On, on the left, we have sort of the theorist sketch, very much uh, a napkin and a pen from Loss and DiVincenzo who were thinking about if I have quantum dots and Coulomb blockades, so like 90s was like a big decade of Coulomb blockade, uh, what can I do with that, right? From that, they came up basically sort of the concept of the double dot and what can be done with a double dot. And that also was the, the basis of uh, DiVincenzo writing down his DiVincenzo criteria, all the things that are required to actually build a universal quantum computer 
on a high level, that is the identification of well-defined qubits, reliable state preparation, low decoherence, accurate quantum gate operations, and strong quantum measurements. Basically, those are the five minimum requirements you have to adhere to before you can think about building a quantum system. At the same time, we have the seminal paper from Bruce Kane here in slightly nicer graphics um, that sort of built on the idea from the 60s that uh, spins in semiconductors have very long uh, coherence times. And if you could actually address them and at the time, that was basically like a almost absurd dream of being able to sort of gate the individual wave function of an, of an impurity atom in a semiconductor, um, try to address all these uh, criteria to build um, a, a quantum, artificial quantum system. And we have like the Y again, which is very similar to what I had on the page before. And then fast forward 20 years, uh, we have the superconducting qubits um, with the big splash from, from Google. I will not go into the details of their circuit, but basically they use superconducting circuits in a square array that have couplers. It's all microwave technology. And what they have been showing in their paper, which is um, not even a year old, is that uh, they can build a functional quantum system. Um, they can basically evaluate the quantumness of their system as they scale the larger and larger qubits. And you see that the system is not perfect. The bigger you make the system going to more qubits, you see that um, the quantumness gets smaller and smaller. At the same time, they they're looked at ver uh, verification, which is one of the big challenges. If you build a quantum system, they actually show that what it calculates is correct. So if you scale the system up, and this is here, uh, the graph on the right, um, if you go to deeper and deeper circuits, um, you see that the validation goes um, basically from only a few hours up to uh, 10,000 years, at least in the claim from Google. So you don't, basically every time you add one qubit to the system, according to this uh, practical evaluation from Google, um, you double the amount of calculational time. And it was the big, push for like saying we have a quantum advantage because there's a huge discrepancy how long this very specific problem will take how to calculate on that quantum hardware versus what it would take to simulate the whole system on classical hardware. We had then very quickly IBM sort of a competitor come around and says, well, we agree with you that's a major achievement, but it actually only takes us two days to simulate what you're calculating. So it's not such a big step. Um, but actually, for me, there's a different takeaway um, from, from that sort of exchange between the two companies. And that is on the first, they actually agree on the, for me, very important demonstration that every time that you increase um, the size of the quantum circuit, either by uh, depth of gate structure or by qubit, you actually double the computational hardness, right? If you want to track that system classically, each time you add, in this case, a circuit depth or a qubit, um, you double the amount of time it takes sort of classically. It's actually not such a big point if it takes two days or 10,000 years. All you have to do is add like a couple more gates or a couple more qubits and you again basically push that out way beyond what is classically possible. And then possibly even more important, it shifted sort of the discussion away from the number of qubits uh, to a more sensible measure that came from IBM, sort of the quantum volume. Like how many qubits, how many gate steps can you create? And IBM just pushed recently uh, the result where they, they claim they have even a larger global quantum volume. All right, so by building a practical system, you can actually check with conventional computation how hard it is and you actually find a measure that's reasonable. And there's also a push for the quality of the qubits. Right? Again, in that uh, quantum volume, there's fidelity. If you have a lot of qubits that are not very good, you don't get a lot of volume. So like big step forward for the community about a year ago, 40 years after sort of the conceptual development and 20 years after writing down what the rules of the game are. Um, so now I jump to the second part. And again, if someone has a question, please jump in. It's not just me talking to my screen. Um, Spin-based qubits. And I will basically pick this up um, by the DiVincenzo criteria. Um, DiVincenzo one was identification of all defined qubits. Um, so the spin of an electron, either spin up or spin down, quantified by the external magnetic field, that's the qubit of choice, basically for spin qubits, uh, that can be electrons uh, bound in quantum dots, or it can be also donors. My talk I will mainly focus on donors, 
Uh, and Andreas Morello's team in 2010 were the first to actually read out the uh, spin of a single electron by establishing a charge conversion process similar to like the LS1 readout, but doing that here now for a single uh, donor atom, where you split the, uh, the spin up and spin down by a size of a magnetic field that's large compared to temperature. And then you have this tunneling event up here for the purple uh, state, which is spin excited state uh, that can leave the donor, whereas the blue state stays put. And from that, you can create spin to charge conversion. So same was done for donors, uh, like for SDM devices a couple of years later. So we have even Chenzo uh, 2, um, which is uh, also the reliable state preparation, because after the spin excited state leaves, the spin ground state comes back. So from that, we immediately know what the starting point is. We have identified um, a good quantum system. We can um, prepare it reliably and also uh, done in the same experiments uh, by Andrea or other co-workers. We also have strong quantum measurements from that spin to charge conversion. So we kicked off um, the Vincenzo one, two, and uh, five of that list. So the next one um, is accurate quantum gate operations. So you need to be able to basically rotate the spin of the electron anywhere on the block sphere. Um, and that was done by uh, Andro, Andrea Morello and Andrew Jure. Um, not late after their uh, first uh, state readout. So in this case, you basically have the um, uh, donor below the Fermi energy pushed down where like, the spin up and the spin down state uh, can both not tunnel. And then you can uh, use microwave pulses to control the spin state um, of the electron, then pull the electron back up to the Fermi energy and read out. So from that, we basically have accurate quantum gate um, operations at the time with low fidelity, as you see here on, on these right plots. But then came the miracle of uh, silicon 28. So if you remove all the nuclear spins from the silicon 29, you basically you remove the randomly fluctuating background magnetic field. And that's the main source of noise uh, for, for such qubits. And you see here now for 100 microseconds, or like a macroscopic time, that's like slower than, than um, like about the time that your camera needs to expose a photo and if it's fast, um, coherent oscillations that basically show no fading in the, in the fidelity. And so we have now very, very good qubits in the semiconductor spectrum. Um, just pausing on that, uh, so Silicon 28, it's, it's a byproduct for the quantum community that came from the metrology community. You see there in, on the uh, lower uh, right photo from uh, Achim Leistner, uh, like a scientist in Australia was part of the project uh, in the Avogadro effort to define the kilogram. That's one kilogram sphere of silicon 28 that is uh, highly polished into a perfectly round ball um, that then is used basically by X-ray diffraction um, to define basically the lattice spacing and from that you can define the kilogram. And uh, these structures were created out of isotopically enriched silicon in sizable quantities. So what you see there on the right is a, a silicon 28 single crystal in a float zone uh, oven. Um, it's about six kilogram in weight, a couple of these spheres in there. And the quantum community basically piggybacked of this effort to get sort of scraps and leftovers to be able to then use the uh, fact that if it's only silicon 28, you have no um, nuclear spins in the system. And um, Mike Thewalt's team with his early optical work actually conned the term semiconductor vacuum. Like, you, if you put like a spin there intentionally, the rest of the semiconductor possesses um, no other spin, so it acts like a vacuum. So we have to link to the uh, ion traps. So we, we know where to put our spins and the rest of the semiconductor actually doesn't <clears throat> really contribute any. So that was a big, big breakthrough. And now basically the um, quantum community is sort of the second um, sort of lifeline, the second evolution in this isotopic enrichment community. Okay, then uh, I showed you the one qubit gate, um, but of course that's not enough to, for universal uh, uh, gate set. You need two qubit gates. Um, I have here, because that's the latest and the greatest in the field, uh, a few realizations of, of the two qubit gate. The first was done um, in Andrew Durek's group um, on uh, MOS quantum dots. So like two quantum dots, each was basically once a free spin. Uh, that were exchange coupled and with that, uh, the team created a two qubit gate. Um, next in line were like almost immediate at the same time were work from Princeton, from Delft, 
and very similar structure. So in that case, it's a silicon germanium structure uh, with a micromagnet. It's, it's basically looks more like a single triple qubit, but they could also operate it basically to create, um, a, a, again, an exchange coupled two qubit gate. Um, so next page on the left, the almost identical device from, from the Delft group. Um, both achieved basically a two qubit gate. The Delft even added like a simple quantum uh, uh, protocol to that. And then the donors came to the party very much uh, uh, soon thereafter, a year later. Uh, we have here an exchange coupled double uh, dot um, uh, from Shell's uh, Simmons group showing a two qubit gate in the donor architecture. So with that, basically we have ticked off like all the DiVincenzo criteria, well-defined qubits, reliable state preparation, low decoherence, um, accurate quantum gate control, and strong quantum measurements. So the question is, can we now basically just scale it up and the problem is solved? Um, and as a lot many of you know, that's certainly not the case. I mean, the two qubit gates have just emerged and everyone's pushing hard to make them better. Um, and at the same time, there's actually a quite severe uh, density challenge. And I think that's nicely illustrated here with this uh, visionary paper from um, uh, Feldhurst and co-workers around uh, CMOS architecture. Um, and basically all below this little uh, black dots there are like the, the 2D array of the qubits and there's into the third dimension basically like the, the, the whole wiring sticking to basically the, the rules of the game, what is possible in semiconductor processing. And uh, what you can take away from that, it's, it's very, very, very hard to create such a structure. I'm not, I'm not saying impossible, but it's just a, a very big challenge because you basically have to create that 2D array of um, the spins in the semiconductor at the length scale of the exchange coupling. So it's basically the length scale of your problem is given by the wave function of the electron because that defines the overlap, that defines the exchange, right? So if you want to build anything sizable there, you have to basically go into the third dimension or with the SDM fabrication, you have to get very narrow lines in because you cannot basically step back from that nearest neighbor distance of about sort of say 30, 40 um, nanometers. And then if we look over the fence, how our colleagues in the superconducting uh, uh, qubit community are, are dealing with that problem, um, they, they have chosen a very different path or like their, their realization of qubits allows them to uh, naturally lead to a very different path. So they work with transmons, which are glorified basically charged qubits um, and so they directly have the charge degree of freedom um, to work with. So they have basically built up structures uh, where they have a microwave resonator and they couple basically the dipole, the charge dipole of the qubit to that microwave resonator. So here on the lower left, we have something that looks like sort of a standard optics coupling experiment. Up there, the blue line is the um, uh, frequency of, of the cavity um, that extends over the whole chip. And then if you bring um, the two qubits, which is the red and the green uh, line there, basically to the same energy, you basically um, couple via the cavity those two qubits. You can basically create a coupling term, even though it's totally non-local, via sharing basically the photons with the cavity. Um, this is shown here on, on the right. This was done um, uh, in a collaboration in, in, in Switzerland in about 2007. So 13 years ago, um, that was achieved in, in uh, the superconducting community and the, the field evolved from there. And it's interesting that this structure from uh, the Princeton group from Jason Petter actually looks to some degree quite similar to that. It's now 13 years later, it was just published this year. And they have achieved now basically the same level of, of control as the superconducting qubits had done 13 years ago, uh, where we, in this case, um, have two of these um, double quantum dot devices uh, with micromagnets that we'll come back to and they're coupled to a microwave bus and you can see basically the impact on the cavity uh, from the left qubit and the right qubit. Um, now in, in a bit more detail so like how do these cavity structure uh, how these cavity coupling uh, uh, works so it is um, a double dot so we uh, have one electron that can either sit left or right, or it can basically be shared between the two quantum dots. And then on top of that, um, there is a micromagnet that ensures basically over those two quantum dots, there's actually a different magnetic field. 
So the, the charge coupling was what pu published soon before this paper in 2018, um, simply basically coupled the dipole of having the electron left, electron right to the cavity, so at the single photon level, so that achieved strong coupling and so did the Delft group um, for such a double dot structure. And the fact that they have the micromagnet now here in this case also allows them to get access to the spin degree of freedom. So you can basically, the single photon mode of the cavity can actually drive a spin rotation. And that is illustrated in their paper here on the lower right and I find it in a nice way. So we have um, the left basis, right basis, um, energy plotted uh, versus detuning. So at zero detuning, uh, the electron basically sits equally left and right. And then we have the spin up and the spin down state of that, so like the left and the right. And then we have the antibonding state between those two. Um, and again, the spin up and the spin down. So then what you do, you basically drive this at the Zeeman splitting, which in this case is very close to also the uh, antibonding state. With that, basically, you have the electron moves a little bit, and that actually allows you to see a slightly different magnetic field. So in this case, you get the um, uh, coupling between the charge degree of freedom and the spin degree of freedom. Like in principle, having the electron move left and right doesn't do anything to the spin, whereas in silicon and silicon germanium, there's very weak spin orbit coupling. But since there's a different magnetic field, that allows you basically then to uh, flip the magnetic, uh, sort of the magnetic moment. Okay, so that, that was my um, general introduction. Now I want to focus a bit more on how one can engineer that spin orbit coupling, either externally and internally, and what the advantages and disadvantages are from that. So, so stepping back for one second again, reiterating that. So in principle, we have electrons in either silicon or silicon germanium that have very long coherence times. But our challenge is that we would like to space them out at least occasionally a little further than the exchange, right? So you can envision have a small quantum processor that then has another small quantum processor at a certain distance and you basically have some longer distance coupling links between that. Now, if you would simply try to do that via the magnetic uh, coupling and Jason Pettery pointed that out very clearly um, like more than 10 years ago, then the, the simple magnetic dipole-dipole coupling at the distance of say 100 nanometers is only tens of hertz. So that's not doing anything. But then if you use the electric dipole uh, induced in various ways, which I will get into, you can get up to coupling strength at these distances of several, uh, even tens of megahertz. And that, that opens you up to even not only work about dipole-dipole coupling directed next to each other, but similar to what I just showed you, also use a cavity and coupling the cavity mode. So the whole objective of this basically use the long coherence times of the spin to create um, some sort of dipole coupling between the spin degree of freedom and the charge, like some sort of mixing between the two of them while retaining long coherence times, but being able to dipole couple, right? So that's what you need to achieve. And uh, by the successful experiments that I showed you from the Delft group and from the uh, Princeton group, they have done this by basically engineering their spin orbit coupling by placing micromagnets. So they have um, a stack similar to what's shown you on the left. There's the silicon germanium substrate um, with the electron being confined in the silicon. Um, and then on top of that, um, there's the gate structure to create basically electronic confinement. And on top of that, they basically have a cobalt micromagnet, which creates the magnetic field uh, gradient. So like shown here on the left, uh, like in the middle graph, you have the two dots, which are the blue dots, and around that is that massive uh, uh, structure, which is the um, uh, micromagnet structure that basically engineers um, hard axis and soft axis to have two different magnetic fields. And here on the right um, is an example where they have mapped out what the magnetic field gradients, which can be quite sizable. Um, at the same time, just looking at this, this um, graph, you can see that the micromagnet is humongous compared to the uh, double quantum dot. So it's certainly, first of all, an additional level of complexity that you get from having micromagnets in your fabrication, um, but also a challenge, I'm not saying that cannot be addressed, uh, in creating basically this very dense um, uh, uh, structure and having the micromagnets on, on top of that. So, um, Jason Petta has been working on cavity coupling uh, spin qubits for a long time. Uh, this is work from his group eight years ago, and you can see that this device actually looks very similar to the, the double qubit device that I've showed you. In the early days, he was working uh, with indium arsenide. 
because he actually wanted to utilize the fact that, say, for example, electrons in indium arsenide, um, they have, due to the small band cap, they have a, a sizable spin orbit coupling. So there's no such thing, say, as a spin degree of degree of freedom or the charge degree of freedom. Whenever you have a motion of an electron that is directly coupled also to driving the spin degree of freedom due to that mixing. And in that sort of landmark experiment from Patterson in 2012, they were able to show uh, that they can electrically drive um, the spin degree of freedom in that system. Um, they can also uh, have coherent control, so Rabi oscillations, sizable like Rabi oscillations, um, quite fast, like Rabi um, period of like 70 nanoseconds. But you also say that in that structure, the decoherence was massive. Um, so that the, the uh, Rabi oscillations died out very quickly. They had a, a very good charge coupling, also compared to what people do now, it's about similar. It's like a charge coupling between the double dot and the cavity is about 30 megahertz. At the time, their spin coupling was quite weak. It's only um, 0.2 megahertz, but the biggest problem was the decoherence. Like in that structure, uh, the, uh, the spin degree of freedom dec decayed very, very quickly. And that um, basically led to the conclusion in, the community that intrinsic spin orbit coupling. So if you rely on spin orbit coupling from the material is a bad thing. Um, you should rather basically uh, engineer the spin orbit coupling externally, basically work with a system that has no spin orbit coupling and basically put the spin orbit coupling in from the outside. And that's where basically we kicked in with our research. Um, so let me briefly um, look at the building blocks uh, that I work with, a lot of the center works with, with our donors in silicon and also basically put next to the acceptors. So for donors, um, we have a state that sits basically just below uh, the bottom of the um, conduction band, um, below basically the, the valley of the conduction band. For that, we get the valleys. Um, uh, but also we inherit basically all the symmetries from the conduction band. And since um, the conduction band is made out of S electrons, basically there's a zero um, uh, uh, angular momentum, so we simply deal with the spin. So like there's very, very weak spin orbit coupling. You can still engineer um, electrically spin uh, driven spin direct, uh, uh, electrically driven spin um, transitions. And Rajiv Rahman and our groups are working on that. So that's, that is possible if you then use a donor in a, in a double uh, quantum, sort of double donor structure. But this is not for the talk today. It's like this is in principle possible. Today, I want to focus on basically acceptors. And the acceptors basically it, um, um, get all the symmetries from the top of the valence band. And then uh, the top of the valence band, um, we basically have a degenerate heavy hole and a light hole state. The, the, the uh, valence band is created basically by um, P-like states. Um, so we have an angular momentum of one. So basically in this case, you get angular momentum one um, charge uh, 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 from the uh, um, charge carrier, so like a S1 half. So you have in total a spin three half systems. And here on the right, uh, we have written out basically what the ground state of the acceptor is. So it's a J three half system. Um, and on the right, basically, are the um, wave functions if you actually consider the, the, the spin degree of freedom in that system. What you can see is that you can actually not obviously uh, uh, disentangle spin and orbit from that system. Because due to the spin orbit coupling, you can only treat the total J in that system, like not the, the single spin. Right? So in this system, you always have to basically consider the total angular momentum. Right? So you have a built-in, actually quite strong spin orbit coupling. Um, so what we deal here in, in, in the paper that I'm discussing um, is like an ensemble of uh, acceptors. Um, and we have looked at them in the strained and unstrained case. And I'll first look at um, the unstrained system. So in this case, we have that J3 half system as I, as I just shown you. So as we apply a magnetic field, what you see is that um, you create a splitting into four, like you have um, the, the three half, the one half, the minus one half, and the minus three half state. So like the ground state in this case is a, is a heavy hole like state. And we have this chroma stoplet in the middle, uh, which is the, the light hole. And then at the top state is the, the other arm of the other chroma stoplet, which is the heavy hole. Um, we can then drive um, uh, a transition in this case, 
between uh, say that three half, uh, one half state, and that's basically a charge transition, right? So that's outside the two chromos doublets. Um, so that, that uh, we'll, we'll show you in a second what the coherence of that, that is, but that's uh, like a charge transition. Or we can also uh, apply strain and that lifts basically um, uh, the symmetry of the system and you transform um, this the spectrum of the, the acceptors into what's loan, shown here on the lower half. Um, in this case, we now have the one half uh, chroma stoplet as a ground state, so the, like the one plus minus one half state of the J three half. Um, and the three half states are pushed up by this train. It also changes the G factor, that we'll show you that later. So the G factor actually of the uh, one half chroma uh, stoplet goes up and the G factor of the three half uh, system goes down. And now we can uh, drive this state basically between the lowest two spin states so within the chroma stoplet. That in principle is a pure spin. Uh, but if you don't push that one half state too far away, you still have mixing terms in that system. So you can actually create electrical drive in that generalized spin system due to mixing with that um, three half state up, right? So in, in our case, there's actually an energy scale here, um, the splitting say between the uh, one half uh, chroma stoplet and the three half chroma stoplet is say in this case about say 200 gigahertz. Um, and at 200 gigahertz, you still have a sizable mixing in these states, which then allows you to electrically drive also um, the spin one half system from the, um, from the light holes. Okay, so this is all conceptual. Um, here's what the experiment looks like. Um, that's an experiment where we prepared the sample, which is isotopically enriched um, silicon 28. Um, independent of the cavity, because we were uh, afraid about what kind of strain we would get from the cavity. So it's basically either a totally unstrained piece of bulk silicon 28, which has 10 to the 15 uh, boron in it. Um, and we mount that on a superconducting resonator. Um, so Q is moderate, a couple thousand, uh, operating at about six gigahertz, uh, very low temperature. We basically have seen temperature dependence down to like 20 millicalvin. So these are very cold experiments. Um, on the right, you see an actual um, image of the, of the chip. So that's the cavity back there. And uh, um, we have put like a red marker over the, um, the silicon chip that just basically sits on top of, of the uh, meander waveguide uh, cavity. Or uh, we have strained silicon. And in this case, we mount like a thin down piece of silicon 28 um, to a substrate. And our colleague, uh, Wayne Hutchison at uh, um, UNSW Atva in Canberra, has carried out cryogenic uh, XRD measurements to actually show that we can strain, uh, by actually strain the uh, silicon, um, basically by utilizing the differential contraction of the uh, silicon versus the, the, the mounting substrate. Right? So in that we can actually strain the system. So that's the experiment sitting in the dilution refrigerator um, and we're carrying out uh, pulsed ESR on that ensemble of boron spins in the silicon 28. And now get to the results um, on the unstrained. So on the left, uh, we have the spectrum. So in, in this case, if we uh, sweep the magnetic field, um, we see a uh, peak that's actually quite asymmetric. So it has basically a sharp component and, and a broad shoulder on it. Um, so this is, as I showed you earlier, the situation where we have the fourfold degenerate ground state. And uh, people who have worked with, um, say, boron and silicon before, you would be uh, surprised or impressed uh, that this peak in general is actually quite narrow. Um, it's, it's only the narrow component about one millitesla, the total component with the shorter shoulder is for the four millitesla. It's considerably narrower than we usually have to deal with. That's basically due to the fact that it's A strained phi and B isotopically enriched. Um, the blue component, the narrow one, is actually due to the one half chroma's doublet that sits in the middle. Right? Like it's protected from the, mainly protected from the environment. Whereas the transition between the blue, basically um, one half state and the three half state, the more charge like one, um, if there's any basically slight strain variations, those will jiggle around and that gives you a broader basically curve. So that's the, uh, the one that has a slightly lower amplitude and that's broader. 
Um, so there's a fit basically with the uh, orange and the blue, which then explains the whole um, uh, line shape. And if we uh, do an experiment where we sit um, basically on the peak of the blue feature and look at the Han Echo T2, we get about 50 microsecond uh, coherence time. That's already much longer than what other people have measured in these ensembles. Also long with what like simple theory has predicted. Um, we attribute that, at least compared to the measurements, to the fact um, that we work at very, very low temperatures. We have seen actually um, down to like the base temperature of 25 millikelvin. We have seen temperature dependence. So you only have to go up to like 200 millikelvin to find similar coherence times to what our uh, uh, other colleagues have found. We have measured uh, T1 in an echo recovery experiment. And from that, we see that the uh, at T1 is about 110 microseconds. That T1 has shortened these systems, basically empty up that um, Kramer's doublet to the other uh, charge state. And T2 is certainly not twice T1, but it's also not, not far off it. Okay, now we go to the strain sample. Oh yeah, maybe I should just point out one thing. Um, so this blue resonance, the narrow one in this case, is about at like 300, say 81, 82 millitesla. So if we tr strain the same wafer, um, you see here a very different spectrum. Um, now you see a broader uh, resonance around say 180 millitesla. So you see that the G factor actually changed uh, from one point something all the way up to 2.6. That's that effect that I showed you earlier. As you pull that manifold apart, uh, you increase the G uh, of the uh, one half and you crush the G of the three half. Um, as shown here in the green and the red. Um, and we have the more broad spectrum um, that we actually by now understand where that comes from. And if we um, uh, measured Han Echo T2, basically in the middle of this feature, and it doesn't really matter where you look at in that broad feature, uh, we see basically this uh, complex line shape um, that gives us a Han Echo T2 of just a bit more than uh, 900 microseconds. And if we measure T1 in the echo recovery, uh, we get about five milliseconds uh, T1. Now then if we carry out um, uh, GP, uh, CPMG, um, decoupling basically from, from the environment, uh, we can push that uh, T2 um, CPMG up to about nine milliseconds. So it really goes up, basically T2 goes up twice uh, T1. And there's the statement now, this is CPMG on, on an ensemble. Um, and there's the statement that T1 could basically, T2 could be basically partly limited by T1. We actually see that as double um, uh, T1, right? So there's, it, it really basically shows you that uh, the, the coherence in that system appears to be limited uh, by the T1 in the system. Now, if we compare that um, to other results in the field, so the first one is um, uh, holes in quantum dots. This is work from uh, CRT. This is in the device. Um, they measured coherence times about 250 nanoseconds for their holes. Um, our hole bound to a boron without any strain has 50 microseconds. That's already considerably longer, like 200 times longer, um, or more than that, uh, longer than what, what we measured there. But then if we actually apply strain, we can push that all the way up to just shy of a millisecond. And that, that brings us, if you compare that to up these upper numbers, um, to the same region where electrons in isotropically enriched um, samples have been. You see now like the, the references dropped off. The first one is an, an ESR experiment on bulk electrons uh, with a T1, of, uh, sorry, T2 uh, Han of about four milliseconds. The second one is um, a donor, again, donor bound electron in a device of about uh, one millisecond. And the last one is an electron bound to a quantum dot or by our quantum dot in the silicon 28 device about one millisecond. So you see basically that the um, acceptor bound hole in the silicon 28 actually has quite similar uh, coherence times than the electrons. Right? So which actually show you that this is a good platform uh, and intrinsic spin orbit coupling is not necessarily an issue. Um, like if you use the full intrinsic coupling, it's actually also still quite interesting at 50 microseconds, but you can basically can tune it by introducing the strain, and that can be done on a full wafer level. Right? That's not a hard engineering parameter. You just basically bound the two um, wafers together and uh, introduce that strain that way. Okay, 
So this was ensemble work. I thought I flush out a little bit of what we have done um, also with single acceptors, um, because the, the, the first one, like when we have um, seen that basically fourfold uh, degenerate uh, uh, state at zero magnetic field that then splits into four, there was always the question, if you go to a single um, acceptor in the device, is that something that you can maintain? Or will the device break that by basically the lower symmetry in the device? And that was an experiment we carried out a few years back in our letters. Um, this is transport spectroscopy. This has nothing to do with ESR. So this is just basically a small FinFET where we looked at transport through an uh, acceptor um, uh, state and apply a magnetic field. And you see here um, the same experimental uh, data as I've shown you before conceptually. We see that splitting into three half and one half of those two chroma stoplets. So it is possible to also establish these states um, in a device. And the second experiment I want to touch upon is something we have published um, just a bit more than uh, a year ago. Um, this is uh, a device where we uh, use reflectometry, which I will describe in the next slide. And we basically have two boron atoms that are tunnel coupled to each other. And you can basically, similar to what, what Jason Petter have done or the DELF groups have done, you can basically shuttle an electron back and forth. Um, so we do this in, in a two electron limit basically look at what kind of spin dynamics we can find in that system. Um, and we read that out by uh, seeing if the electron can actually move from left to right. So it's a basically a tank circuit hooked up to one of the gates. And whenever an electron can move, it basically creates a change, slight change basically in the, um, in the charge distribution um, that changes the capacitance of the system. And since uh, that is actually the shift of a, of a wave function potentially coherently that's called the quantum capacitance. You can really measure that quantum capacitance even of two boron atoms that are coupled like by like four gigahertz. In our case, we've mapped the tunnel coupling to about four or five gigahertz, actually quite close by. You can still see single electron moves back and forth and, and back that out. And what we did basically in, in this publication, so we went to the Coulomb block, sorry, in the poly blockade regime. So we go to finite magnetic field, we see that jumping back and forth crushed because you need the right spin uh, configuration. And with that, in this experiment, we could actually map out uh, the T1 in that system. The T1 in this the system was quite short. Um, we could measure that very fast with the reflectometry experiments we did. And what we learned from that is basically you have two competing effects, basically the, polaris, uh, the quantization axis imposed by the magnetic field onto the system versus the uh, quantization axis imposed by some local asymmetry. So that created basically a hotspot. We could detect that. But the main takeaway is we have basically created um, insurance in this experiment and the other that we have that fourfold degenerate ground state. And we can also actually also access like an isolated double boron system um, in the singular triplet regime. Okay, so with that, um, 45 minutes later, I, I quickly summarize. Um, I didn't introduce qubits because this is a CQCT workshop. I take that as given. I uh, basically showed you um, uh, the, the magic of the spin-free host in which the spin qubits have achieved all the Vincenzo criteria uh, pointed towards that scaling problem that we face for logic wise uh, systems at a little more general introduction to what um, has happened in the last 40 years after the introduction of quantum computing. First back of the napkin uh, drawings of what qubits look like up to the point of uh, having uh, sizable quantum processors of like it's, it's between 10 and 50 qubits that can either sort of just push a calculation that's hard or Google also just came up with a science paper where they've shown that they can do a simple quantum chemistry calculation with that same processor. Um, then showing you that uh, intrinsic spin orbit coupling is not necessarily a bad thing. These are interesting uh, uh, qubits um, and uh, we'll basically follow on and then push towards basically a single qubit coupling with that. Um, and with that, I should actually tell you who has done the work, it's not me standing here talking about this. It's uh, Takashi Kobayashi was the main person who set up these experiments. He was the one basically uh, establishing the um, uh, low temperature, uh, the ESR in our group um, came up with the uh, uh, creating the strain in those structures. So he's the main person to be credited for, for this publication. The whole thing is, of course, a collaboration. Uh, we've benefited from the characterization from Wayne Hutchinson at uh, UNSW Canberra. 
All the iron plantation is done by our colleagues at Melbourne, uh, Brett Johnston, Jeff McCallum. Uh, the isotopically enrichment, uh, rich materials we kindly are received by um, that group who basically supplied the whole community. We wouldn't be there without them, all coming from basically Avocadro. Theory support from Rajiv Rahman's group, the Melbourne group, and also Dimi Kalsar here at UNSW. There wasn't much STM in this, but I still left them on there because everything is interconnected in this. And then the transport group uh, carried out that, I just mentioned uh, down there. Um, and with that, I want to thank you and just leave up one slide about ICPS that unfortunately did not happen about a week ago or two weeks ago um, due to uh, COVID. Uh, we rescheduled it into 2022. That's all hope. Um, I'm quite confident it will be a brave new world then. Um, uh, have a look. The website is updated and I hope to see many of you at that conference um, to discuss semiconductor physics. Thank you.